so maybe I can start in the meantime. Thanks, Carlos, for a super nice and interesting presentation. So what I'm going to present now is um, uh, a work that we've uh, had uh, with some colleagues from the World Inequality Lab on uh, land inequality. So I'm Yechna Govin. I'm uh, from the Copenhagen Business School, as Carlos has mentioned. I'm also affiliated to the World Inequality Lab. And uh, this is going to be joint work with Luis Bolus, who's at CUNEF in Madrid, Filip Novokmet, who's at the University of Bonn, and uh, Daniel Sanchez, who's um, at the Paris School of Economics. So I think the title is very self-explanatory. Uh, We're going to be looking at land inequality in the developing world. And what I'm going to try to uh, show you with this uh, very simple and straightforward presentation is the fact that we want to revisit the measurement of land inequality in the world today. And I'm going to tell you in a second why we think it's important to do that. So before going there, um, I just wanted to present a bit the motivation. I mean, it's just the theme of the whole uh, conference, but still I just wanted to point out that land inequality is going to be super important because exactly because the poorest of the individuals in the world are going to depend on uh, agricultural land or land in rural areas. So according to FAO, three out of four of the poorest uh, billion individuals in the world depend on agricultural land for their subsistence. And this link between uh, the livelihood of the poor and, uh, and the dependence on agricultural land has been shown in, uh, uh, extensively in the literature. Um, so we believe that studying land distribution and access to land is going to be a very important uh, tool that is at the hand of uh, different uh, countries when we want to tackle uh, poverty alleviation, and especially in developing countries. So there are many different aspects of which, uh, with which like, land inequality is going to be important. Um, you can think of like, really many different dimensions, one of which I wanted to point out today is uh, the fact that there is also a, a very straightforward link between land inequality and economic development that has been shown uh, in the literature. So um, uh, in the literature, there has been an, um, some, some papers that have shown that uh, the initial uh, distribution of land is going to matter for, um, for subsequent uh, growth rates. And um, you can think of different channels for which that happened. It can be because of the fact that uh, the more you have land inequality, the more it's going to impede uh, the development of the financial sector because the poorest would not have access uh, to this asset, cannot use it as a collateral to ask for credit, and so on and so forth. So there has been some evidence that shows that the higher land inequality is going to impede the financial uh, development in different countries, and that's going to affect uh, uh, subsequent uh, growth rates. So, uh, and, and just another big strand of the literature that you might already be familiar with is the fact that land concentration is also linked to agricultural productivity, and that is also going to affect uh, economic growth. I don't want to go in details on these. This is just to motivate the fact that land inequality is going to be related to bigger questions like poverty and economic growth. What we're going to do in this paper is to take a step back and try to understand how land inequality is measured and whether it's measured in the best way possible to uh, tackle these questions. So um, the first premise that we're going to pose in this paper is the fact that we need more clearly defined and more consistently measured uh, land ownership inequality uh, measures in, in, in the world. And uh, here, I've, the, the word ownership is in bold for, for uh, good reason. It's because it's going to be the central point of this paper, is to try to understand uh, whether we can measure ownership uh, inequality in land and not other types of inequality. And why am I really uh, putting an emphasis here? It's because, that, because of the fact that the existing literature, the existing cross-country uh, estimates of land inequality that we use uh, today uh, is from Dillinger and Squire. It has relied a lot on agriculture census data. And what happens, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm sure you all are uh, agree that agriculture census data has provided us with very valuable information when we speak about land inequality. What I'm going to speak about today is more the disadvantage of using agriculture census data. So, um, apart from the fact that this agriculture census data in different countries uh, has uh, are collected with different, sometimes different uh, parts of the land. So sometimes governmental land are included, sometimes uh, private land are included, and that might change uh, cross country and over time, making comparison across countries and over time difficult. The three main problems that I'm going to focus on uh, when we want to 
consistently measure land ownership inequality is the following. So the first one is the fact that um, the definition of uh, the, 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 the measurement of land uh, according to agriculture census is to measure the size of operational holdings. And what we're going to argue in this paper is the fact that operational holdings does not necess necessarily mean land ownership. So you can think of the fact that, uh, so basically, agriculture census data is going to be uh, a collection of this, the size of farmlands uh, that are under single management. That's the, the, the formal definition by, by FAO. And uh, what happens there is the fact that each of these plot of land, if they are not under single management, are not going to be linked to the same owner. So if, so if a, a single owner has different pl plots of lands in different rural areas, these plot of lands are going to be considered as one piece, as if each, as if each plot of land is owned by one person, separate, one different person. What we would like to, uh, in the discussion of land inequality in terms of ownership, we would really want to know whether these pieces of land are connected to a single owner. And if we uh, think about what I've just said, then that would mean that we might be underestimating land inequality in terms of ownership when we rely on agriculture census data. The second point that uh, we're going to try to revisit in this, uh, with this paper is the fact that, by definition, the agriculture census data is going to measure uh, the land sizes. And we know that different types of land can have different values. And when we are thinking about land inequality in terms of sizes, it might not be the same as land inequality in terms of uh, the values of the land. So what we're going to try to bring, and I'm going to show you in a second how, is to bring a, a, a measure of land inequality in terms of uh, the value of land. The uh, third and final piece of the puzzle is this, I think, the most important part of this discussion, because of the, the, what I've just motivated this talk with is the fact that land inequality is really important for the poorest individuals in the world. And uh, because census data are going to measure existing pieces of land, it's going to miss out on those who do not have any land. So we're missing the most important chunk of uh, the, the distribution that are people that are dependent on uh, agriculture but do not have any access or do not own any land. So what we want to do with this new measure of uh, land inequality is to make sure that we account for uh, the landless population. Okay, uh, so we do not, I mean, we're not arguing that the agricultural census data is, is wrong or is, it's not, uh, is not useful. It's actually definitely useful to understand uh, efficiency. There's been a large literature that relies on that. But what we were uh, going to argue in this paper is the fact that it might not be as useful or as precise when we're speaking about equity. So uh, what we are going to do in this paper is to move to a different source of uh, information, that is the household survey data, that a lot more survey data have uh, introduced or has had uh, a lot of uh, agricultural modules in the past, and we're going to try to exploit these agricultural modules that goes in details on uh, the land that is owned by different households. Okay, so in a nutshell, what we do in this paper, we uh, exploit survey data, which, which is going to allow us to focus on the land that is privately owned uh, by households. We are going to uh, provide consistent estimates of land ownership inequality across countries in different regions of the world, both in terms of area and value and accounting for the landless as well. And then uh, the countries that are going to be covered in, uh, in our work is for now the ones that have the best available surveys uh, in terms of uh, information in terms of area and value. This is going to limit us to around 15 countries in the world for today because of the fact that we really want to work with the, the ones where we are sure that the estimates are more or less precise. Uh, we're going to work more uh, towards including other countries as we go on. Um, I'm aware that this table is not readable uh, by any of you, but I didn't want you to read anything out of this. It's just to show you that we have used a lot of uh, surveys survey data and also the agriculture census data in different countries in the world. And uh, there are different years of the different surveys. So, but it's approximately all in the 2000s, so early uh, to uh, late 2010. Okay, so just a few words before showing you uh, um, what, uh, how the, the results look like. So in terms of uh, the methodology, the first chunk that I've spoken about is that we're going to look at land area inequality, which the existing uh, literature has also done. 
And we're going to be first up updating the estimates uh, using census data. So we're going to go with the existing literature. We take census data as they have used, and we're going to just update uh, the existing uh, literature. So uh, the, the, as I was saying earlier, the existing uh, literature has done systematic cross-country estimates of land inequality, but it dates, dates back to the 1990s. So we don't have consistently estimated land inequality uh, series after that, and that's the first contribution we want to bring to this table. The second point is uh, what I've just explained, is the fact that we're going to depart from using census data to provide new estimates based on survey data. And then we're going to uh, estimate that using uh, Gini coefficients and top land shares. That's the equivalent of top income shares, if you're uh, familiar with uh, the top income shares literature. The unit of observation, I just want to take a second to detail like the, the, the few uh, notes of caution that we have to have at the back of the mind when we're uh, interpreting the results. The unit of observation here is going to be focusing on private owned lands or household farms. This is going to exclude governmental owned land, so communal land, if you want to think about it that way, or corporate land. So that's a limitation, I think, of, of uh, not, having, uh, not being able to take into account government-owned land or corporate land. But on the other hand, uh, the, the nice advantage of using uh, the surveys is that we can really consistently, we know what we're, we're consistently measuring household uh, farms across country and over time. I forgot to mention that uh, here, uh, the, these different countries have different waves of the surveys that we could exploit. For now, we're only exploiting the most recent uh, and best quality uh, survey, so it's only one point per country. We don't exploit the time dimension of this. Um, in terms of the measurement of the size of land, what we're going to exploit is that in all of these uh, agriculture modules, we have self-reported size uh, of the plot, we have GPS data, and we also have measurement uh, using ropes uh, by uh, the, the, the person who's doing the survey. And what we're going to try to do is to try to use uh, all three informations to try to combine and see if it's all converges to the same information. And then we're going to try to validate this by using other survey data. For instance, the DHS has a component, has a question actually about do you own land and what's the size of land? And we're, we're going to try to see whether that corroborates with what we're doing in the LSMS uh, work. Finally, in terms of ownership of land, the question, I mean, this for development economists, you might know that this is like a very tough uh, thing to work with in uh, developing countries. It's the fact that land tenure is not a very clear uh, concept. Um, so what we're going to do is to use a combination of questions that are from the questionnaire. So the first one is, do you or anyone in the household own this land? What is the ownership regime? How was this land acquired? So different countries are going to ask this question in different ways. Normally, we have four or five questions that are going in the same direction. So we're going to try to exploit uh, the rich information in this uh, to uh, be able to say something about ownership. Um, the second step is the value inequality. I think that's the most challenging uh, uh, part of this discussion, is the fact that we want to est estimate the value of land and its distribution. And currently what we're doing is to use the self-reported value. So people are asked, if you had to sell this land tomorrow, how much you would get on the market uh, from that land. We're aware that this is not probably the best or most ac accurate uh, estimate of value, so we're trying to work on a more refined measure of that, but I think it gives a more or less a nice uh, picture of value of land. Finally, including the landless, uh, here we're going to account for the population dependent on agri agricultural uh, land that are landless, and uh, there are different ways of doing that as well. Uh, one, the way we are using now is to uh, look at uh, who are in the agriculture module but do not declare having any land. OK, so let me get uh, to the result. What we find is four main uh, takeaways, if you want to remember something from this paper, is the fact that when we estimate land area inequality, so I want to uh, here emphasize that it's area inequality from the census and the surveys, they're highly correlated. <laughs> OK, <laughs> I was like speeding up on this. So yeah. So when uh, we use it from, uh, when we're focusing on areas, uh, the inequalities uh, estimates from census and surveys are very highly correlated, so they're very similar. So then you might ask, what's the point of doing this exercise if the agriculture census is already doing a good job in uh, estimating land area inequality? But what we're going to show next is that land area inequality can differ importantly from uh, land value inequality. So that's the main, uh, one of the main uh, results of this paper. 
Moving forward, accounting for the landless, I mean, this is a no-brainer, is going to change the estimates of inequality because you're adding people that don't have any land. It's as if uh, not accounting for the landless would be the equivalent of not accounting for people that don't have any income or un are unemployed. So here, accounting for them is going to make a difference to the inequality estimate, and it's going to actually vary depending on how, what's the proportion of the landless population in these different countries. And I'm going to show you in a second that this might be very different. And finally, uh, and, and why this whole exercise is very important, is the fact that the regional patterns that we're going to see in terms of land inequality, according to what we are going to choose as our benchmark metri uh, metric in this paper, is going to contradict existing patterns uh, from agriculture census. So if anything, I think this is uh, one of the main points that is that we need to have a discussion around how we're measuring land inequality because it's going to give us different pictures of how the different countries are standing in the world. Okay, so um, this is the first uh, result that I was showing you. This is the land area inequality using Gini coefficients from uh, census uh, data. So this is the, the using kind of the existing literature um, uh, methodology, and this is our estimate. And what you can see is that the correlation between the two is pretty much uh, uh, very high. Uh, the R square is around 88, uh, 0.88 here. Going f further, so this is departing from the Gini estimates, we're now using the top land shares. So this is the uh, uh, top 10%. Uh, so, uh, so sorry, this is the top land shares uh, among uh, landowners and uh, in terms of area and then in terms of uh, value. So this is telling you how much in different countries, when you account for value instead of looking at the area, what's the, uh, the, the level of inequality. So uh, what we can see here is that you're going to see different patterns in different countries. The African countries, most of them, the, if you look at the land value inequality instead of area, it's going to increase our perception of uh, inequality. On the other hand, if you look at Ecuador, Guatemala, and uh, some of the Latin American countries, what happens is that there seems to be big uh, plots of land that has a very low value. This might be uh, plots of land that are used for pastures and, and so on. So there seems to be something going on that if we only focus on land area inequality, we might think that it's much higher in the, in the Latin American countries, but actually uh, looking at the value of that land gives us additional important information. Um, this is in terms of uh, accounting for the landless. So I have a table in the paper that shows you the different proportions of the landless population. Of course, this by default is going to increase inequality, but what I want to show you here is the fact that it's going to increase inequality to different extents in the different uh, parts of the world. So uh, if you account for, I think the most, um, I mean, the ones that you, are, you might be uh, looking at is China and Vietnam that has a completely different, uh, different uh, regime in terms of land ownership. That's why uh, accounting for the landless is not going to matter in China and Vietnam. But then if you look at uh, African countries or uh, uh, some part of the Latin American countries, you see that this has a massive increase. So I just want to uh, kind of, um, this is like the final uh, result slide, if you want to, in this paper, is a combination of all the three uh, parts that I've just explained to you. So this is the first green bar is going to be area inequality. The blue bar is value, land value inequality. And then the red bar is value uh, accounting for the landless. So what I want to show you in this graph is the fact that if you only focus on land area inequality, which is what we have done in the past, we're going to uh, have a certain ranking on, of these different regions of the world. But then if you move to the last uh, estimate, which is our preferred estimate, so including value and accounting for the landless, you can see that these different pictures are going to change. So now. China and Vietnam uh, is going to be uh, among the lowest uh, unequal countries, and that's going to increase uh, a, a lot more in uh, Latin America, and uh, it's going to basically switch the ranking of China and Vietnam uh, with respect to the remaining countries. Okay, so I want to conclude here by saying that, I mean, this, it's a, it seems like a, a, that land ownership inequality is not exactly the same as land uh, holding inequality and accounting for the difference in land values and uh, including the landless is going to make a difference. And I mean, even though we have a lot of things that we still need to do in this paper, there's a lot of analysis in terms of uh, income distribution and so on that we want to take into account uh, from now on. 
But I want to say that even if it has some limitations, I think it, if anything, it brings a valuable discussions to the table. That is to say that we really need to understand what we're measuring and try to reflect on whether the existing literature has been doing a good job in estimating uh, land inequality. Thank you so much for your attention.